day uh, <clears throat> was Jesus went to the synagogue. There are certain interesting aspects I want to uh, share with you today. The first thing it says, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. He went to Nazareth, that's exactly, he's called the Jesus of Nazareth, isn't it? Let me explain to you that there is a difference between a person from Nazareth and person who has been, uh, who's called a Nazirite. Person of Nazareth is different and a person who's a Nazirite is different. Now who is a Nazirite? Classic example could be Samson, John the Baptist. These people, they had their conditions. You find these conditions in book of Numbers chapter 6. How a Nazarite must live. You cannot cut your hair, you cannot drink wine. Uh, so these are the conditions that you have. But Nazirite is different from Nazareth. And uh, I don't know how far this is true, but there is a belief that says that, you know, the people from Punjab, in, um, they're, they're the only community, isn't it? They're the only community in the world where the men also grow their hair, isn't it? Right? They put a turban. But they're the only people. But there is a belief that probably they have come from, you know, uh, some, this is Nazirite stuff. They don't cut their hair, isn't it? Yeah. So, Nazirites are different. Nazareth is different. Nazareth comes from the city of Nazareth. Nazirite is a vow is a style of life. It can be for a lifetime or it can be for a short time. You can make a vow and say those days, okay, those days. You can make a vow and say, okay, I'm going to raise my, my uh, you know, uh, grow my hair and then you offer it to God, isn't it? That's what Paul did. Of course, that's a mistake in the New Testament. Uh, he should not have done that, right? But what he did was he made a vow that he will give his hair to God, like what would God do with there, right? isn't it? So uh, you cannot make a vow. James says that. James says, don't make a vow at all. And in the Old Testament it says, if you make a vow, make, make sure you fulfill that. But in the New Testament it says, don't even make a vow like that. But what we find here in the case of Jesus was, he's not, he's, probably he was also Nazirite. But uh, he was definitely from Nazareth. Right? He was definitely from Nazareth. It was prophesied. So Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. On the Sabbath day, <coughs> he went into the synagogue. And you see the next phrase, as was his custom. Okay, now what do you understand? Why did, why did God, uh, God put Sabbath? Sabbath was put before rest. What, should, what are you supposed to do on Sabbath? Take rest. That's what God said. In other words, come, if you, if you really go into the definition of Sabbath, going all the way back to the uh, study in Garden of Eden, it is spending the first day with God. I've said this many times, but let me repeat this. God worked how many days? Six days. And on the seventh day, He took rest. So when God was taking rest, listen to this carefully. When God was taking rest on the seventh day, what was man doing that time? He was also supposed to take the rest. What was the day for uh, uh, man when God was taking rest? Put it simple. God's seventh day was man's first day. Yes or no? Man was created on the sixth day. God was taking on the seventh day. So we are actually looking at God's calendar and say God took rest on the seventh day, yes. But what was that day for man? It was rest day, it was the first day, the Sabbath day. So what is he supposed to be doing? He's supposed to be spending time with God in the presence of God. So when Jesus came to this earth, this is something very beautiful about Jesus Christ that we see. Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. He began to do and teach. So, what many times that we see here these days is what? There's more of teaching, there's less of doing. What Jesus did was he did and then he taught. 
What do you think it did for three and a half years? Or 33, before the three and a half years, what did it do for the rest of the 30 years? Right? 30 years. He was an obedient son. He was an obedient son to his mom, his dad. And he grew up in such a way that as a young man, he challenges people in his own community in John chapter 8 and says, can any of you find fault in me? Wow, what a wonderful young man, isn't it? And here you find, what did he do? As he lived on the earth, it was his custom for Jesus to go to synagogue on the Sabbath day. I want to show you one more person in the Bible, Acts of Apostles, chapter 13. Acts of Apostles, chapter 13, and verse 14. Uh, from Perga they went on to Pisidia and Antioch. On the Sabbath day they, uh, and, uh, they entered the synagogue and they sat down. Look at verse 42. As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to speak further about these things on the next Sabbath. Verse 44, on the next Sabbath almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. What do you find here? Paul is going to synagogue every Sabbath. So when we say you need to go to the house of God, no matter what, you know people get offended. So why should we come to church? Okay, hold on. I don't I don't care about the success or the failure of WWJD. What is WWJD? You know that? There is a movement in US called What Would Jesus Do? WWJD. I don't care about the movement. How it fizzled and what, what happened, why is it not successful later and all. That's a different thing. But I like that phrase. What is that? What would Jesus do? What did Jesus do? He went to synagogue. Okay, why are we supposed to take baptism? The sinless God, the sinless Jesus himself went into the water. So, don't you think we are supposed to? Here we find that he took care of his mom on the cross. While Jesus was hanging on the cross, he was handing his mom over to John and said, Take care of my mom. So, are we not supposed to take care of our parents? People like me, we are unfortunate because I don't want my parents to take care. But when parents are, are with you, but they are still alive, I, I tell you, take care of them. It's very difficult for your children to grow without their grandparents. That's one big thing that's missing in my family. My children don't have grandparents. You know, father and mother could be strict but you know, grandparents will be very will make you very comfortable. You know, somebody said, you know, the only reason why God gives you um, grandchildren is so that you can compensate your anger now as love on your grandchildren. Jesus was going to synagogue. Not only that, he was taking care of his mom. And he was an obedient son. So what Jesus did is what we need to take example. So here we find, what did Jesus do? He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and that was his custom. That was his habit. Every time. At the age of 12, when, G when they went to Jerusalem, where was he lost? You know, our children would be lost in some uh, some state park or some fairgrounds or somewhere, right? They forgot Jesus was in the temple. He was, what was he doing there? Yeah? I, I see a lot of parents getting upset and said, See, it's okay, don't worry about my son. Hey, what did Jesus do at the age of 12? He was in the temple, he was talking to the teachers of the law and they were amazed at his wisdom. And this is what I always say. 
make sure that your children grow in the house of God that is the safest place can you show me another any other safe place in the world for your children can you show me let's do this let's go to high school my daughter studies in John Dickinson high school let's go to the high school and go one round in the hallway we'll just make one round in the hallway by the time you come out it may be say 10 minutes in these 10 minutes you know how many cuss words you will hear in the corridors and the wall uh, uh, hallways go to Maryland in that school what happened there all sorts of mischief isn't it we saw it in the news what about if your children grow in the house of God that's the safest place do you think yeah, the Mary and Cub, the John you know they were they were ordinary people but one thing that they made sure was what they made sure that they followed the law and then brought Jesus to the temple and then that became and he continued even when he grew up even when he in, entered the ministry he came to the synagogue and this is what I always tell suppose you are traveling somewhere this is a vacation time right vacation time you're traveling somewhere that's all right we need uh, rest but make sure that you go to some church even if it's not this place if you're traveling somewhere make sure you go there you know why because probably that message is exactly there for you in Oklahoma when I was a pastor there we had a deacon and he was a retired man he was a very good hunter he never bought meat outside he always hunted his own meat maybe let it be any animal you know bears you know deers and buffaloes or whatever he'd go hunt and then give it to the shop and then they chop him up chop it up and then give it to him the way he wants and one day he came and told me pastor I'm going for hunting and we used to have Bible study every Thursday and we, uh, I was able to teach Genesis to Revelation in two, two years and this man was telling me uh, pastor I, I want to I'm, I'm going for hunting and I said when are you leaving he said Sunday early morning 7 o'clock I said wow so what are you going to do for your worship I said we'll be traveling really I said yeah I'll be traveling I said can you come to my office you know, when you hear that it's kind of, kind of dangerous right it's kind of difficult when somebody says come to my office so I said can you come to my office tomorrow I said, oh, he said alright so next day he came to my office we sat down and I had a discussion with him I said you're a deacon isn't it he said yeah so the Bible says you need to go to the house of God the people who want to argue like should we go to the house of God look at this verse so <laughs> when are you traveling it's a Sunday morning 7 o'clock I said what about your church said I won't be able to make make it to the church I said uh, are you working I said no um, so you're retired isn't it yes I'm retired so is there any emergency that you have to travel I said no you're going for hunting hunting is no emergency we already planned it right so you paid money and then you got your guns loaded everything and uh, why do you why did you want to travel on Sunday oh because all my friends are going on Sunday I said see let me tell you one thing you are a deacon and you want to travel and not go to church on Sunday what kind of testimony would you have before people that's not alright he said I have been a deacon for 35 years and nobody told me this I said alright never late he's a 70 year old man okay and I said uh, that's alright uh, let me do this I won't stop you from traveling you know I won't stop you from traveling but when you're going this direction at 930 there is a service in that area in that church just go there attend the service and then continue your journey is that okay he said yeah please give me that address I gave him the address and he started at 7 in the morning and he's very punctual about time 7 in the morning he started driving he went to that spot and then at 930 he went to that church and he heard the message and after that he came back after 10 days and then the first thing he did was he called me and said can I come to your office I said wow this is strange he's asking me like can I come to your office I said oh please come 
So he came and said, Pastor, I want to thank you for what you did that day. I said, why? That day, that message, that preacher was preaching was for me. You get it? The Lord always speaks in various ways. So therefore, what you do is you never miss that opportunity of hearing God. Isn't it? Worship is what we give to God. At the same time, we hear from God. So therefore, never lose that opportunity. Never, never lose that opportunity. And therefore, that man said, thank you. People on the roads, traveling, that's all right. This morning I saw a group of people there, my friends from Maryland, and they are at Rehoboth Beach. You know, at 8.30 they are all gathered in their tents, in their camping tents, and they are worshiping in the morning. I said, wow, that's amazing. Never miss the appointment with God, amen? Never miss an appointment with God. So therefore, what the first thing Jesus did? He went to the synagogue. Not only that, look at verse 16 again. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. <clears throat> um, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read. He stood up to read. You know when they were reading, they were reading the scripture they had this habit of standing and reading. You know what is the meaning of standing and reading? Respect. When somebody is, uh, somebody comes in, what do you do? Suppose somebody superior to you shows up, what do you do? You get up. You get up and say, hello sir. Suppose somebody who's not so big, what do you do? You sit down and say, hey, how are you man? But if it's somebody superior, you don't sit and say that. You stand up. When they were reading the word of God, what did Jesus do? He stood and he stood up to read. How much respect do we give to the word of God? There's a video, beautiful video in, you, in Facebook about when the Chinese people got their Bibles, how they took the Bible. There was, the Bibles were smuggled. Can you imagine Bible being smuggled? How many of you have faced a situation? How many of you have bought any smuggled goods? Anybody? No, right? That means you have so much of freedom. If you are buying smuggled goods, there will be a lot of fear. There will be a lot of fear that you will be caught. And here the Chinese people, the suitcase was open, they were ran like you know, hungry people jumping on to grab Bibles. Do we have that situation? No. Can you imagine how much freedom we got? How much freedom we got? How many translations do you have? On your iPhone there's an app called uh, uh, Uversion. Uversion has multiple hundreds of uh, languages. Hundreds of languages. And I know the guy who provides the material for this app. He goes to different countries, he goes to different uh, places in the world and picks up the language and the Bible and he digitizes it and gives it to Life Church. And they produce all this. So many translations, so many versions. That's why probably we don't know the value, isn't it? When you have so much, how many of you really don't like your mom's food? No, it's nobody there like that, right? You like your mom's food. And your mom's food looks very delicious, especially when you're hungry. And she didn't put any, any you know, salt in it or nothing, but still it's very tasty. You know why? Because you're hungry. Because hungry. How many of you ate, uh, uh, enjoyed your food with uh, rice and uh, pickle? Yeah? Enjoyed it? Yeah? Is it really good? No, but that moment, yes. You know why? Because before that time, you were so hungry, so you really liked that food. You are hungry. These days, there's no hunger for the word of God. There's no hunger for the word of God. I want to hear from God. I want to listen to what God says. You don't see that. We are so, we spend so much time on the news. 
we spend so much time on other things that we don't have time to read the word of God what did Jesus do? he stood up to read what is he reading? actually his own words isn't it? the verse that he read was exactly written by it was quoted by Isaiah in 61 he is repeating it here and when he's reading his own word he's respecting it so much so how much more should we be respecting the word of God? Bible says do not be listeners of the word but be the doers of the word Jesus stood up to read the word of God see are these not good habits that you find in Jesus? going to synagogue every Sabbath as a custom without a compromise without missing it secondly reading and how is reading? standing up and reading respecting the third thing I want to show you verse 17 Luke chapter 4 and verse 17 the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him unrolling it he found the place where it is written so they gave him the scroll those days there was no chapter and uh, verse okay those days when Jesus was there the Old Testament what did he read? Old Testament See, it was not uh, categorized as chapter and verses it was done much later so when it was given to him can you imagine a book without numbers no, no chapter no verse and the Bible says you know what Jesus what was, what was done to him read that carefully verse 17 the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him so you hand over the scroll like this okay it's like a, you know two rolls brought together so you, you keep opening it and closing it like this and uh, the Jews have so much of respect for the scrolls you know how, how they do that that is uh, made out of goat skin that is made uh, the covering is made out of pure gold and they don't open more than three sections at a time so if you want to open so the whole scroll is there right so they open only three columns at a time because they say the word is so precious that you cannot just leave it so what do we do when we do Bible studies you know have you seen uh, uh, some pictures the Bible is open there is a coffee cup there yeah there is a pen and there is some notes there and you see take a picture you know what the Jews would do you, they will never leave the word of God open you know why because they say if the word of listen to this carefully if the word of God is open it must be read it cannot be left open and that's why they read that portion they, they open the portion and they close it and use another book which has the same copy of that and they read it from that so what did Jesus do? He, what was done to, there? the scroll was given to him okay the scroll is huge so scroll is given to him so the Bible says when the scroll was given what, what, what does it say? he found the place where this was written and now book of Isaiah is a big book it's got 66 chapters now we have numbers those days there were no numbers can you imagine the huge book that was given to Jesus and then he went through and then he found the place what does it mean? he knows the word he knows where is what you know that's one thing that's missing in this generation you hear some people talk like this uh, somewhere is it written isn't it yeah I, I don't know where it is but somewhere it is written like this so if you really sit down and do some more hard work you'll find where it is instead of throwing things in the air and say ah somewhere it, it is there isn't it sit down and study meditate the word of God study to prove yourself is what the Bible says he says you need to study to prove yourself look at first, uh, second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 
do your best to present yourself to God as one approved a workman who needs you need not be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth so does somebody have a King James version right study to show thyself approved unto God what do you need to do with the word of God you need to study the word of God study to those show thyself approved not unto men approved unto God he says you need to study the word of God Jesus provided three examples to us number one he did what he went to the synagogue number two he stood up to read and number three he found the place where it was written he went to the house of God now it is the church those days it was synagogue now it is the church secondly he respected the word of God number three he knew where what was and then what did he read let's go to that part verse 18 <clears throat> the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to release the oppressed to proclaim the ear of the Lord's favor one classic thing about this chapter is it is mostly talking about filling of the Holy Spirit look at chapter 4 and verse 1 look at the beginning of the chapter Jesus full of the Holy Spirit he was full of the Holy Spirit chapter 4 of Luke is a powerful chapter talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit and he says verse 18 the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me let's see these words they're very precious words very powerful words he has anointed me you know preaching needs anointing singing needs anointing how many of you heard about this man called David Green have you heard about David Green David Green is the owner of Hobby Lobby now you remember Hobby Lobby there's another Bible store called Mardell he owns that same thing that's a division of Hobby Lobby Hobby Lobby you know that Hobby Lobby right the owner of Hobby Lobby is David Green I got an opportunity to meet him so David Green said to me like this he said Pastor Chandra just as you go to the church to preach anointed I come to my office every day anointed you know he's doing business he's doing business he sells the you know uh, interior decoration stuff very respected company they have pastor chaplains in that company the headquarters in Oklahoma City and this man says I go to my office to do business anointed and the whole world saw the proof how a few years ago there was a case against them the government said you need to provide the plan B as a part of the medical um, uh, you know the uh, health insurance and he said I'm not going to do that they said then in that case you are pay a fine he said I'm ready to pay a fine and then the uh, case went to the court you know what happened Hobby Lobby won the case against the government great celebration everywhere I'm not trying to endorse a person but I'm trying, trying to tell you the historical truths facts in our own generation when you go to the mall and see hey, in the food court every store is open on a Sunday but the lights are shut off in a Chick-fil-A those people are men of God he I, I know the family that goes that family goes to a church in uh, Atlanta Jonesboro why do you think God blesses people like this when we do work and then he anoints us 
I always say this, I'm not a good singer. But I always ask God for one thing, Lord give me anointing in what I do. Whether it is singing or in preaching or playing music, give me anointing. And the word of God says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and because he has anointed me. You know, the anointing has a great power in it. When David was anointed, when he was a shepherd boy, and the father was not even ready to tell any, uh, tell the prophet that he has another son. See where God took him? What, when, what changed in this man's life? Tell me. His heart was right with God, and God anointed him. So what happened? Is there anybody who doesn't know King David now? What was he with the day when uh, Prophet Samuel came to his house? He was a nobody. His dad didn't, didn't, didn't want even uh, uh, mention his name. Prophet says, do you, women, do you have any other son? He said, yeah, there's one fellow. A totally unknown, anonymous fellow. What happened to that David? He became the king of Israel. That anointing can do so much. Look at Elijah. Elijah had that anointing. He was ready. He was able to challenge the prophets of Baal on the mountain. We need an anointing in our life. You may say, I'm not, I'm not a pastor. No. You don't need to be a pastor to be anointed. Whatever task you got, whatever ministry you got, whatever calling you got, you need anointing. And anointing doesn't come because you go to the Walmart and buy you know, five gallons of anointing oil. No. It's not because you buy some oil somewhere. It has to come from God. And you cannot manipulate God to do what you want. Can you? You can, man you can manipulate people, isn't it? But you cannot manipulate God to give you what you want. He will give you only when he sees your heart is right. He says he has anointed me. No, number one, he anointed me. Number two, to preach good news to the poor. Good news to the poor. Here it's not talking physically about the uh, poverty, about the money point of view. He's talking about people who don't have the word. He says good news to the poor. Give a good news to the poor. Number three, he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Freedom for the prisoners. See, um, Anybody who's been to the jail knows what is the meaning of freedom, the real freedom. Yeah. It's been a long time, but I tell you this story once again. When I went to Botswana, there was uh, one person, his name was Sergeant. And uh, he showed up at the church and uh, the local pastor was telling me that this is the man who just came back from jail. I mean, how, would you like to uh, associate with somebody who just came out of jail? Have you met people? I met people. I met him on the uh, near Home Depot somewhere and I was talking. He said, hey, how are you, man? He said, uh, yeah, I need some help. I said, why? He said, I, I just came from the jail. Well, really? I just got released from the jail. So you start thinking so many things. Really, man, do I need to even associate with you? Can I shake hand with you? You man, just came out of jail. Yeah, we go to this um, Sunday breakfast mission. I met people outside. And then when we were giving away food and the blankets, and one guy comes and says, hey, sir, excuse me, I need, I have nothing, I just came out of the jail. I said, look at him and say, what, you just came out of the jail? Yeah, I just came out of the jail. That fellow knows what is the meaning of freedom. Sergeant was in the jail, you know why? Because his, um, you know, his girlfriend cheated on him. So he got mad, he was a very strong guy, and then he hit her on the face and she died. He hit her and he died. So he was taken to jail. And in the jail, as some of our brothers from India, can you imagine? People from India, in Botswana, doing ministry there, in the jail, and people are saved. I baptized 14 prisoners, 14 uh, prisoners in the jail. With their jail, you know, with their jail uniform. 14 people. Wow, what a, what a privilege it was. We said, can we take pictures? He said, no, 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 you cannot take pictures here. He 
So I don't have anything to show you. You just have to relate everything. I baptized 14 people and the, the beautiful ministry that those people are doing in uh, Botswana there. Sergeant was in the jail. And they asked me to preach in the jail. The great ministry that that country allows. The uh, month of September is the prayer month. Everywhere you'll find prayer. So when I went to preach, and usually you want to make, you know, because they're so depressed, and so we want to make them laugh, isn't it? So yeah, I just wanted to crack some jokes, and nobody's laughing. So I asked the prisoner, I asked the preacher, and said, why are they not laughing? And that's a good joke, isn't it? You liked it? He said, yeah. Then why didn't those guys uh, laugh? The only reason they're in laugh is they know by 3.30 they're going back to their cell, and they're going to face a black wall. Wow. 3.30 in the afternoon, they're going to be put back into the uh, cell and they have to keep staring at a black wall. That's it. So sergeant uh, wrote his story and then gave it to me. And sergeant said, one day, somebody came running and he was saved in the jail and he was such a good man that he became almost a pastor to all the other prisoners. So one day as he was uh, having his porridge, breakfast in the morning, somebody came running to him and said, the officer is calling you. So he went to see the officer. He stood there and the officer in the first time in 17 years, he said, sit down on the chair. 17 years, first time. Can you imagine that? You go to a person, your officer, and for 17 years you're not allowed to sit, first time, he said, sit down. So he sat down on the chair. And he said, tell me what would be your reaction if you were told that you are free today? He said, sir, I'd be so excited, a jump or a joy. He said, sergeant, the president has approved your petition and now you are free. Now you're free. Sergeant just leaped out of joy and said, now no more bars, no more black wall, no more sorrow, no more depression. Then he was out of the jail. The message came that changed his life. Jesus says, God sent me to proclaim that good news to the prisoners so that they can be free. We are prisoners of sin. He that, that sinneth is a slave to sin. So we need that good news. That good news will redeem us from those shackles. That's what Jesus came to do that. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. The blind people, they need to get their eyes. They need to have sight. To release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. To proclaim the year of Lord's favor. These are the things that Jesus came to do. I don't have time to explain all this, but I just stopped in the middle. But I want to sh share some of the thing and then we will close. This portion is found in Isaiah chapter 61. Can we look at that and try to compare it? Isaiah chapter 61. Remember he was given the scroll of Isaiah? And he found the place where it is written. If you see here, chapter uh, 61 and verse 2. Look at verse 2. And keep this open, uh, Luke chapter 4 and verse 19. Look at, uh, look at 419 first and then we'll go to Isaiah 61. 419 says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now go back to 61 2. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Now he missed out the last part. Do you see that? In 61.2, he didn't say the last sentence. Why? Because in 61.2, the first line to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor is talking about the first coming of Jesus. And the day of vengeance is talking about the second coming of Jesus. And that was the first coming of Jesus. Therefore, Jesus 
read only half of it and then he sat down you get it he read only half of it because that was his first coming but if you go to 61 2 there are two uh, uh, mathematical numbers that we find number one is what ear of God's favor ear one ear 365 days according to the Gregorian calendar right 365 days of what God's favor how much how long is the vengeance so see the second part how long is the vengeance one day see how gracious our God is right if you try to reverse it and see try to reverse it year of vengeance and one day of favor <laughs> Lord that's no good at all right that's no good see our God is such a gracious God and that's why he's giving us time again and again and again say come close to me come hear me listen to me and therefore year of God's favor and day of vengeance and we are not there yet isn't it we are not there yet so we know that there's going to be a day of vengeance and he wants to redeem us and free us from that situation so here we find it says he read this and what did he do verse 20 Luke 4 20 then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and immediately you say you know the next line says the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him why why were the eyes of the people fastened on Jesus you understand what happened that day he read the verse gave the scroll and he went, went back to tea, uh, sorry, sit down he went back to sit down and everybody's eyes were on Jesus why in the Jewish custom when you read the word of God you stand when you teach you sit see when Jesus taught what was he doing all the time he sat in Peter's boat Luke 5 look at that Luke, turn, turn the page you'll find it Luke chapter 5 and verse 3 he got into one of the boats and one belonging to Simon and I asked him to put a little from shore then he sat down and taught the people from the boat isn't it he sat down and taught the people from the boat look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1 Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1 now when he saw the crowds he went up on mountain side and uh, sat down his disciples came to him and began to teach them saying so what do you find here what do you find here uh, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3 one another verse Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3 as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives the disciples came to him privately tell us they said when will this happen what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age you know what is happening whenever he was sitting what was going to happen teaching he was standing he read he gave the scroll and he came and sat down and now people knew okay now he's going to teach so what are people doing their eyes were glued to Jesus let me see what he has to say uh, there, there, is, there is a very famous uh, uh, radio uh, preacher I'm sure you, you all know from India his name is uh, uh, RRK Murtikaru oh wow Man. my friend says he was born for the radio his voice is amazing his language is impeccable and uh, uh, he was my mom's Sunday school teacher can you imagine my mom would always say oh he was my uh, teacher he was my Sunday school teacher yeah and there was another chief minister of Andhra Pradesh um, chief minister and he was my dad's uh, math teacher and my dad would say hey you know what my mad teacher is now the CF chief minister you know my mom would say such and such a big man is my teacher wouldn't it be awesome that we say my teacher is Jesus Christ wow 
And these people are waiting to hear what Jesus had to say. My dear brothers and sisters, there's a lot that we can go and see, but I want to uh, conclude now. You know what we learned today? Number one, Jesus went to the house of God. He made it a custom. Number two, he knew how to respect the word of God. Number three, he knew the word of God. Not only that, he was fulfilling God's commission for him. He says, today, look at verse 21. Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What does it mean? Whatever was ordained for me, that has come to pass. Whatever is ordained for you, it has to come to pass. You need to obey God and God will fulfill that in your life. And here, he was ready to teach and people were expectantly waiting for him. And when Jesus taught, you know how many people showed up? big crowds and people said his teaching is a little different man it's not like the way our teachers of the law of Pharisees and all these guys teach us there is something special in him you know what that is? I can tell you what that is that is the anointing that is the anointing as we go into the summer and we have starting from next Sunday on we have for the next six weeks we have a lot of work to do we're going to be so restless we'll be very tired we exhort every weekend we have very big events happening you know what you need to ask God God give me the anointing even if I have to mop this uh, uh, vacuum this area if I have to do cooking I have to do teaching I have to teach the kids I have to do something whatever I need to do in all what I need to do, dear Lord, can you give me your anointing? And that anointing will change people's lives. Amen? And we need that anointing. May God help us to learn from this portion about what Jesus... This is not a fiction, you see? This is literally happened some 2,000 years ago in some synagogue. I don't know if it is still there or not. But in that synagogue, this is what happened. May God help us to learn these principles and we'll take part in the table.